Hey there. Did you miss what happened in the last episode? Don't worry. I've got you covered. Our hero Les had a brutal battle against a martial arts master. He won the fight, but he lost a part of himself in the process. He was descending into a spiral of hatred, a shadowy abyss of regret and fear. However, before he completely lost control, a strange woman crash landed near the lake bed. Les managed to save her and stopped a man-hunting zebra from crushing her head. While protecting the stranger, Les found a part of himself that had been dormant for a long time, a peaceful protector of those in need. Now, with his new friend Steel by his side and his renewed outlook on life, he pushes forward on his quest to revitalize the Barren Bay Basin and to better the life of the less fortunates. A pair of nomads showed up to the settlement, Urka and Purple. They asked the companions if they can shelter with them for a few days since they recently lost their home in a flash storm. Even though they were low on food, they couldn't turn away people in need. Less and Steel welcomed them in, but let's just say these two were interesting. Urka, the older of the two, was internally conflicted. She was a psychopath who's great at fighting, but also squeamish and delicate. Purple, on the other hand, he, uh, well, he kind of just sucked as a person. He was a jealous slowpoke with an annoying voice, and he loved to brag about how he trolled people whenever possible. Les put them to work immediately on some of the easier growing zones, while he focused on planting drago trees. That evening, the group faced a dilemma. With food supplies running low, they needed to hunt zebras, but Les was hesitant. He wanted to preserve life as much as possible, and the zebras represented that. After a vote, the group agreed to hunt only three of them. The other two, male and female, would go unharmed so they can continue on. With a plan in place, they set off into the night. Like their caveman ancestors from the ancient past, the group ambushed their prey and beat them with their clubs and knives. The first two zebras went down with relative ease, but when they attacked the third one, it sparked the animal's herd instinct and a bloody brawl ensued. Hoof and club clashed in an epic battle atop the sands. In the end, the group was battered, but victorious. Urka got the worst of it. Her nose was shattered and her left ear was ripped off completely, but overall, not too bad. Urka looks like a stereotypical 80s slasher standing there with the bloody knife. Actually. So does Purple, though he gives off more of a 60s or 70s Manson vibe. What type of people did we lit into our home? After a rough night, everyone was exhausted. Surprisingly, most of the zebras were still alive. Urka began butchering one of them, but then she realized how injured she was and went back to rest. Purple, being the miserable person that he is, went into a sad wander. More than likely, he was just trying to get out of doing work. The next few days were pretty calm mostly spent on routine work like harvesting and crafting. With fall creeping in, the group knew they had to prepare for the winter. Despite being in the desert, they were still in a rather temperate part of the world, and it could even drop into the single digits during the colder months. Everyone had their own internal struggles to deal with, most of all, Urka. Her injuries healed quickly, but she was still dealing with some heart issues and a severe drug problem. She was tough, no doubt about that but every time she let up another smoke leaf joint, Les caught a glimpse of something in her eyes. Something fragile, perhaps fear or loneliness. We also added an addition to the cabin to make it feel a bit less cramped. We also experimented with planting some cacti and agave further to the south, hoping the growth would attract more wildlife. At some point, another raider from the Cancer Men attacked. Les severely beat him and threw gravel in his eyes. They keep sending single raiders our way, it's almost like they're trying to sacrifice unwanted people from their faction. Either that, or they're just incompetent. Yeah, it's probably the latter. Les and Steel kept a close eye on Purple. Urka had informed them earlier that he hadn't left her side since their settlement fell, like some kind of lost dog. According to her, the only person that actually liked him was his mother. He was still in his own world, retreating deeper into whatever sadness had gripped him. On the 3rd of September, Les learned that the visitors were keeping a secret from him. They were both good researchers. They told him of how important knowledge was in their former colony. And though their settlement was lost, they still had some of the charred records from their archives. Together, the group decided to begin research on basic furniture. As the name implies, 
This would give them access to the basic furnishings of a home, especially beds, something they were sorely lacking. They created a study corner to read and discuss ideas. Even Purple was beginning to show some personality, though his voice was still a bit grating. While the others focused mainly on their research, Les continued to study the nature around him. The zebras were healing nicely, and the crops were doing okay, though they were starting to show signs of wilting due to the changing seasons. Thanks to this greater understanding, he reached a level 10 plant skill. A day later, Urka and Purple packed up their things and said their goodbyes. They thanked their hosts for taking them in, and promised to never forget about their hospitality. When they left, Steel quipped about how a small part of her would miss Purple's annoying voice, and Les agreed. He admitted that he had grown fond of them. Their appearance and demeanor made them unlikable at first, but once they got to know the pair, they turned out to be pretty decent people. Now it was just him and Steel once again, back in their little green slice of home in the middle of nowhere. Just when things were calming down, Steel noticed two large shapes across the lake bed. A pair of thrombos entered the area. It appeared to be a father and son duo. Seeing the majestic beasts lifted their spirits greatly and reinforced to them that nature was beginning to return. It would seem that both Steel and Les are interested in taking their friendship to the next level. They kept awkwardly complimenting each other, but their attempts at flirting went over each other's heads. Steele tried to woo Les by complimenting his open-mindedness, but he rejected the advance without even realizing it. Soon after, Les tried to attract Steele by subtly complimenting her hopes and dreams, but she inadvertently turned him down. After their failed flirting attempts, the conversation naturally drifted into taming reindeer. The experiment with the agave and cacti to the south seems to have worked. The thrombos were gorging themselves on it. For some reason, it was only the father thrombo eating, and the son seemed content. This one is just being a stereotypical dad. The obnoxious thrombo dad continued picking at its buffet of options. This time, it was eating our trees. Why, man? Why the trees? When the pair weren't admiring the nature, they were hard at work, researching and cooking. After a few more days of playful banter and awkward eye contact, Steele tried again to romance less. This time, she joked about drunkenness. Somehow, he managed to pick up on the joke's subtle romantic undertones, and they became new lovers. The 10th of September was a day of firsts for the settlement. Traders from the Grey Hill Nation arrived. Finally, our first actual traders. They were led by Lerno the Butcher. He seemed to run a pretty organized crew. They all wore toques. Well, except for the Huntsman, but maybe they were a special rank or something. We sold them the drugs we collected from the raiders, and then Steel made a butchering table. This was officially the first real piece of furniture for the settlement. The following morning, we received a gift from the sky. A uranium meteorite smashed down to the south. Steel loved to mine things, and she excitedly got to work with her pickaxe. However, we soon learned that the exotic space rock contained a toxic substance, one which blighted the nearby rice. The pair rushed into action and cut down the diseased crops before they can affect any of the others. More animals entered the region from the south, this time lions. Wait, lions? With any luck, they'll just stay down there and eventually wander away. A cluster of cargo pods crashed down just north of the settlement. It's just a bunch of lettuce. Between that and the butternut squash, the pair would be eating a lot of salad over the next few days. Two bad lions don't like lettuce. That evening, a new enemy appeared from the north, a pigskin named Melissa Archer. Quite a fitting name for someone with her shooting capabilities. Les and Steele saw her approaching and quickly devised a plan. They would flank her from behind the saguaro cactus and pray that they didn't get shot. It seemed like a solid enough plan. Thankfully, the raider whiffed all of her shots, probably due to the pressure of seeing two people charging recklessly at her. They closed the distance fast and the companions made short work of her in melee combat. She dropped due to a crack wound. That's a funny name for an injury. Steele took the raider's revolver for herself. Then she and Les exchanged a knowing look and she walked back to the cabin. Just, uh, just keep watching the stars, Les said to Lissa as the woman struggled to breathe. He swung his club down upon her head and ended the woman's suffering. 
He ran the dead raider's pockets and found a transponder. On it was an encoded message from the Fallen Empire. They wanted to test out a new weapon, one which affects the weather itself. Intrigued, Les asked for more details. And somebody answered. A person named Pusky informed them that the test would cover the designated area in a rainy thunderstorm for 17 days, but in return, they would send them a gift of their choice. Les was momentarily stunned. He wasn't sure if fate was real, but he believed it wholeheartedly in that moment. What were the odds that that specific raider would have attacked them? One raider with the transponder, a key to opening up the floodgates in the sky. Yes, he thought. This was the answer. This was the missing ingredient to revitalizing the entire region. He looked over at the dried lake bed. He would wake that sleeping giant once again. Husky coughed into the mic, interrupting his train of thought, and he insisted that Les make a decision. He agreed to the terms, and he chose his reward, a brand new telescope. He sent the agent their coordinates, and a minute later, a package arrived at their door. Man, the Fallen Empire is actually better than Amazon. He went back inside, just as the rain started, and nudged Steel to wake up. He explained everything that had just happened, and when she asked why he chose the telescope, of all things, he smiled and said that he did it for her. Now she can look up at her family anytime she wants. Well, once the rain stopped, of course. Tears erupted from her face before he even finished the sentence. Oh no, he thought. Did he say something hurtful? She wrapped him in a tight hug a second later and thanked him. The pair fell asleep in each other's arms. And for the first time in a long while, everything in their lives felt right. Early in the morning, while the couple were asleep, an iguana self-tamed to them. Great, now we can practice on training animals. As the forest, stormy weather moved over the land, the oppressive sun was replaced by dark, low-hanging clouds. The life-giving rains that have forsaken this land for so long had finally returned, though by unnatural means. The calming waters washed away their past, both figuratively and literally, and it washed away all the blood. In order to capture as much rain as possible, Les dug several deep holes in the lake bed. To his surprise, while he was digging, he discovered spouts of water hidden in some type of natural reservoir that was lying dormant beneath several feet of soft sand. Over the next few days, the water continued to collect across the lake bed. At first, it appeared like small puddles, but over time, those puddles merged into ponds, and those ponds continued to grow and connect. At some point, chunks of spacecraft fell from the sky, providing the pair with much needed steel. No, no, not that steel. On day 38, another person fell from the sky, a lore keeper named Burnin. He's a bit clumsy, but other than that, he's a fantastic colonist. His skills are going to be great for our revitalization project as well. On the first day of December, Burnin decided to join the group. Now there's one more less fortunate. Les then received a call over the radio from Heracus Pustos. He asked for some help regarding scrappers from the Squids of Cash. That's a pretty good name for a gang. He asked Les to draw the gang's attention away from their caravans, and in return, they would offer him an honorable title. He agreed to the terms and used his Kodak to radio one of the local scrappers in the area. Her name was Panna the Lonely. The Empire had given us some intel about her before the call. She was steadfast in her ways and unwaveringly loyal to her cause, so there would be no talking her out of her position. Knowing this, Les resorted to the tactics he learned on the schoolyard as a kid. He teased her about her age and insulted her mother. The woman was enraged and promised that he would pay for such insults. So it seems that the plan had worked. The following morning, the group waited anxiously for the gang to arrive, but they never did. While they scouted the area, they studied the lions down in the south. However, they were both laying bloodied on the ground. After a closer look, it was determined that the beast had gotten into a fight and killed each other. That's both tragic and wonderful at the same time. Well, that takes care of that problem then. Steel and Les hauled the dead lions up together and talked about life. Despite the rainy mood, there was plenty to be happy about. When they returned home, Les fell to one knee. At first, Steele thought he was hurt and rushed to his aid, but that is when she saw the homemade wooden ring he was holding in his hand. He confessed his love to her and said that he wanted them to spend their life together. 
Steel broke down crying and accepted his proposal. She couldn't wait to become Steel S. Kant. Hey everyone, just wanted to say thank you again so much for all the support you've given me and the channel, really, and um, I, I, yeah, I just want to let you know I appreciate it so much. I'm truly grateful. I, I probably sound like a broken record by now how many times I say that, but it's honestly the truth, so thank you. And I also wanted to give a shout out to those who had found the hidden smiley face uh, in the last video. I did, I did hide a little smiley face in there, and um, I thought it was easy to find at first, but then I realized <laughs> as it was going on how subtle it really was. So uh, th this next video that you actually just watched does have something hidden in there, and I will post about that in the community notes. But yeah, so again, thank you so much for participating in that, and want to give a shout out to Berzoza over on Discord, and also to Adam Bor Borowski. I think I said that right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's the same person actually um, between Discord and the YouTube comments, but I'm not entirely sure. So if it's not, congratulations to you both. And if you're the same person, well, great job getting in it on both. You're awesome. And I have an honorable mention for Diop as well, who nearly had gotten it, but was just a little bit late. Uh, so definitely looking forward to seeing what you think of the next hidden item in the video and seeing if you get it this time. So best of luck to all of you, and I look forward to doing more fun things like that with you as we continue growing on the channel. But that's it. So until next time, guys, I hope you have a great day, and take care.